Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Tim Brooks. He's another alum of uh, the MDO lab, one of Keem's former students. Uh, he's also had some recent commits to OpenMDAO. He's probably been deeper into the guts of OpenMDAO than anybody who isn't on the dev team or was recently on the dev team. He's been dealing with a lot of like parallel file data transfer issues, not file, data transfer issues. So um, I know he's been doing some cool stuff with OpenMDO relative to the D8, and uh, he's going to share that with us. All right. Hey, uh, good morning. It's lovely to be here. Um, if any of you on the OpenMDO team are familiar with me, um, you may refer to me as that guy who keeps on bothering you with all those emails. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some of the efforts that we've uh, taken to uh, implement OpenMDAO on one of our uh, NASA-funded projects that we're looking at at Aurora. Um, specifically in investigating um, the technology of uh, active aeroelastic tailoring. Um, so kind of the, the idea of this project, the name of the project is um, the Performance Adaptive Aeroelastic Wing Project. This is a project uh, sponsored by NASA. And ultimately, um, the goal of it is what, what they want to do is ultimately quantify um, the, the, the benefits of active aeroelastic tailoring for flexible wing designs. Um, and the, the particular mechanism that they're looking at for um, accomplishing this uh, active tailoring is basically taking um, a traditional aircraft wing layout, taking the trailing edge, um, the entirety of the trailing edge, and breaking it up into basically a series of um, independent control surfaces. Um, in this case, we have roughly six equal, equally uh, spaced control surfaces dividing up the, the trailing edge surface of the wing. And the idea is that you give the, uh, the flight control system um, the ability to independently actuate and um, uh, actuate and uh, uh, schedule each one of these control surfaces deflections during flight as a function of the flight condition. Uh, so the idea behind that is that during um, certain certain flight conditions, you can uh, approve kind of a multi-objective um, <laughs> approach. Uh, so for instance, during maneuver flight, you can uh, actuate the uh, the control surfaces in a way to reduce uh, structural loading um, and get away with an overall lighter wing box structure. Um, then for um, nominal cruise flight, you can um, actuate the, the, the trailing edge control surfaces in a way to uh, reduce the induced drag on the wing and improve fuel performance. Um, in particular, what we were really look, uh, interested in looking at on this project is applying this new technology to next generation aircraft vehicle designs, which we know will feature uh, probably even more uh, aeroelastically flexible wing designs. Uh, so from that perspective, we chose the D8 as our benchmark kind of baseline aircraft model that we were going to modify with this. Uh, where was I? Um, yeah, so we took the, the D8 as a baseline uh, model aircraft and then uh, threw on some uh, distributed control surfaces on uh, six on each wing, uh, mocked up a, uh, a rough wing box model for it. Um, and then decided to, uh, we wanted to use OpenMDA ultimately to, uh, to use its optimization functionality to kind of quantify the maximal benefits that we could get out of um, the active tailoring uh, methodology or architecture for this uh, aircraft configuration. Um, so th this is an inherent design problem that uh, kind of features a lot of aeroelastic coupling, uh, specifically between the aer aerodynamic and structural disciplines. Uh, so for that reason, uh, part of the, this effort involved developing our own um, kind of coupled aeroelastic framework uh, module in the OpenMDAO framework. So we started with OpenMDAO as basically the, the base layer for this, um, uh, for this framework. Um, and then we coded, a, we basically uh, wrapped in several um, open source tools into that um, to kind of facilitate the analysis. Uh, so on the structural side, we used uh, the TAX uh, finite element solver, which is an open source finite element solver developed by uh, Dr. Kennedy. Um, what's really nice about this uh, solver is it's, um, it, has, uh, it has inherent uh, adjoint and sensitivity capabilities built into it. Um, it's a full 3D finite element solver, um, uh, and it's, of course, open source. Uh, the only really development on our end that was required to, to kind of integrate this into OpenMDA was uh, developing kind of a light uh, wrapper module to, to kind of integrate um, the, the inherent C++ Cython layer of tax into uh, OpenMDA modules. Um, and then on the aerodynamic side, we used a vortex lattice uh, model uh, method. 
Uh, uh, we used an op another open source tool developed by uh, John Yasa, uh, Open Aerostruct, which was actually conveniently already uh, developed in using the Open MDAO framework. So um, in terms of development on that side, um, that effort was pretty minimal um, since it was already integrated into the, the, the framework. And then kind of once we had those two uh, separate modules in the, the solver, um, most of the development came in in the middle here in terms of coupling the two. So um, on our end, we had to uh, develop uh, a load and displacement transfer module in OpenMDAO, um, an in-house custom uh, scheme for basically tr taking the loads from the, the VLM uh, mesher model, transferring it to the structure, um, applying those loads, and then uh, getting the displacements and then uh, deforming the, the VLM mesh and then kind of closing the loop on this, this coupled cycle. Uh, so here's a look at the uh, aeroelastic model that we ended up using for this study. Um, we have a basically a, a half body, but meant to model a, a full configuration of the, the D-8 aircraft. Um, and then we discretized each of the control surfaces individually on the trailing edge of the wing here. Um, on, the air, on the structural side, we're only modeling the, the wing box structure itself. We have a full 3D um, shell-based finite element FEM to model that, um, including the rib spars and uh, skin panels. Uh, and then we basically superimpose these two on top of each other to get our um, aerostructural model. Uh, we kind of neglect all the other structural components for like the um, empennage and fuselage. And um, for the purposes of the aeroelastic study, we kind of assume that those are rigid. We're really more interested on the uh, aeroelastic effects on the wing uh, for, this, for this work. Um, so rather than going into more detail on kind of the specific implementation um, that we used for this project, I'm kind of going to give a high level overview of some of the OpenMDAO tools that we used in the development process for a lot of this work and what we found useful and potentially uh, uh, lines for future work or uh, thoughts in terms of um, improving um, each one of those um, functionalities. Um, I'd, I'd be more than happy to go into more specifics as well on some of this work um, in terms of implementation at the end, um, if there's questions on that as well. So to kind of start that off, um, I'd like to start with like the, with the N-squared diagram. This, is, um, this was a uh, feature that I found particularly useful for um, developing OpenMDAO components from scratch. Um, it's a really great tool in terms of visualizing your model and making sure that all of the components um, have been implemented correctly, are um, kind of ordered correctly, the variables are being, uh, information and inputs and outputs are being passed um, between the models in the way you expect. You're not a uh, really great way to, for kind of uh, looking for broken connections and, and also visualizing coupling um, in your model. So here I have an example of one of our, um, of our uh, aeroelastic or aerostructural model here. Um, so it's just like a really nice way of, of being able to visualize it. A, a really good functionality in terms of being able to, to kind of nest these multiple layers of, of, of groups in, into uh, your, your higher level model. Um, the ability to, to kind of zoom in and, and minimize some of these groups if you want to focus on uh, certain specific subcomponents. I really appreciate that functionality. And then other things like being able to, to kind of uh, to find the, the global uh, variable names for each one of these uh, uh, low-level variables by kind of hovering over it. Th that level of information is really helpful as well. Um, in terms of possible improvements, this might be a little bit controversial for the audience, but um, one of the common um, complaints or suggestions I've heard from uh, my company is um, there are a lot of pro GUI people um, in our design team. So, um, one thing I might suggest, I really like the, the interface, and I think there might be some capability for integrating some level of, more level of interactability with it. Um, it doesn't have to be a full OpenMDAO functionality, but maybe an OpenMDAO light where um, you can, the user might be able to manually arrange and reconnect um, the components on the insert diagram and perhaps export that model as some uh, some, some, some pre-compiled uh, set of code or, or something. Um, up for discussion, but that, that might be a way of uh, kind of getting some new uh, engineers who aren't necessarily familiar with a high level coding um, introduced to the code um, as a baby level step. Um, and then uh, I'd like to also second the point that Eric made earlier on in terms of um, kind of the uh, the, the scheme becoming kind of unwieldy for large um, large 
group or large, large model sizes. I've seen this as well, particularly when I scale to uh, large numbers of uh, flight conditions that we're considering um, on the clusters and whatnot. Um, this can really start to chug in terms of uh, uh, kind of not just visualizing it can be very difficult, but zooming and moving across the model, it can sometimes just crash or freeze. Um, so I, I'm not sure if there's some, but I, I, it sounds like there may have been some improvements on this line, so I might have to look into that. I'd be interested to hear what some of that is. Some, not, potentially not enough. Okay, yeah, but there's, there might be some, um, there may be some opportunity to further kind of optimize that functionality as well. Um, so, in terms of another tool that I found is particularly useful was the, uh, the gradient check tool. So this is one that I frequently find myself coming back to um, in order to verify the sensitivities of, uh, of each of the modules that we uh, kind of develop in OpenMDAO. Uh, one day I will be able to write an OpenMDAO function from scratch without having any derivative errors. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not at that point now. This is a um, pretty, pretty convenient way of finding those bugs. Um, and, and kind of zooming in on the problem and figuring out what component is to blame. Uh, really like the ability to check not just like the, the component level derivatives, uh, component by component using the partial checks, but also the, the total um, uh, model level derivatives as well um, using the total derivative checks. Um, it's really, really great functionality. I like the, uh, the relatively new addition of the directional derivative um, checks for the partial derivatives for models that feature large numbers of um, state variables uh, where it may be impractical to do a finite difference check for each one of those variables. Um, instead doing a, a one um, in dimensional step in a semi-random direction um, is a very kind of efficient way of uh, checking multiple uh, partial derivative components at the same time um, for relatively little additional uh, computational cost. Um, this, this is overall, I'd say, a, a, a pretty well working um, functionality. I can't really add anything to it in terms of improvement, so I can only really say good job on this, on this feature. Really, really kind of like it. Um, pretty intuitive. Um, in terms of performance, so here are some of the, like an example of some of the results that we ended up getting from this study. Uh, so just kind of summarize it, we ended up scaling up to uh, around 822 design variables for our, um, uh, for our study. Uh, these include both aerodynamic and structural design variables um, for the D-8 aircraft. Um, so we basically st structurally sized each one of the components of the wing box and then allowed the optimizer to play with the um, control surface scheduling for each one of the flight conditions. Um, and then we had 713 aerodynamic and structural constraints for the model. Um, and then finally, and this was kind of the important point, we were able to ultimately show up to 12% improvement in fuel burn performance. Um, and we were able to show it through kind of the mechanism we were expecting to see, which was uh, uh, active maneuver, uh, maneuver load alleviation. Um, so in that sense, we were, very, we were actually very successful in using OpenMDAO to kind of uh, accomplish the goal of the study that we, were, um, that we were trying to do. So we were overall very happy with that. In terms of performance, I would say we were really happy with the fact that there was a relatively little overhead cost of the framework itself on top of the um, kind of lower level solvers that we were using to wrap it in, uh, wrap into it. Um, so that was a, a very good from kind of a, a computational efficiency standpoint. Um, really sophisticated parallelization capability. So we're able to throw these problems in our clusters and take advantage of um, some of the derivative coloring um, uh, approaches, um, distributed components um, and uh, parallel groups to basically parallelize a lot of these, this, uh, this work um, and really scale it up uh, to make it uh, fairly, fairly easy to, 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 to throw on a HPC cluster and um, uh, kind of get that parallel scaling benefit. And then uh, finally, like the, versatile, uh, the versatility of the API was really appreciated as well. So it's not too convoluted to kind of use a lot of these um, uh, high level functionalities in the code. Uh, really like the ability to, to be able to turn off um, and on design variables and um, different uh, constraints uh, kind of with a simple single level, high level command usually in the, the master script. So um, it wasn't too convoluted. So really appreciate, uh, I guess that's a, a, a good testament to some of the API writing in the, in the script and the code. Um, in, in terms of improvements, um, one thing that I'm still kind of struggling with is um, I have a lot of difficulty in terms of initializing components that sometimes depend on other components in the uh, setup loop. 
So the way it works right now is like OpenMDAO goes through each one of the components in the N-squared diagram and sets them up, I think, in sequential order. But if you have one component that's at a certain point in the setup procedure that depends on another component maybe later in the setup procedure that hasn't been set up. So say you have an aerodynamics module that needs to know how many structural variables or structural uh, uh, nodes that your structural model is going to have and that that hasn't been set up yet. Um, that kind of gets to a, a feedback loop that's not really closable in the OpenMDAO framework as it is now. So I found some hacky approaches to kind of getting around that, but maybe having like a functionality for like a second setup loop or some, something, something like that might facilitate um, kind of uh, getting past that. Um, and then there's some features that still aren't quite, uh, as of my knowledge, uh, available for the parallel um, functionalities in OpenMDAO, specifically solver recorders, I don't think are currently supported. Recorders on solvers? Yeah. Yeah, in parallel. I'm sure that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that should, could still be something of use for- Are you for, putting case recorders on solvers? Yeah. I mean, like it's, yeah. I said nobody would ever do it. Okay. I mean, like it's, it's I mean, it's good to see the convergence of not just the optimizer sometimes, but also the, the solve itself um, to make sure everything's going well. Um, yeah. But yeah, so if some of that functionality could be developed further, that might be of use to us. Uh, in terms of post-processing, the Ovis tool is really a really cool way of kind of uh, uh, doing basically the, the convergence check on the optimization after it's been done. Um, it's kind of a really useful debugging tool um, from an optimization standpoint. Really like the ability to take several design variables or constraints and then stack them on top of each other and kind of from that, um, the iteration history infer the different trade-offs that are being made be between the design variables, constraints, and objectives. Um, really kind of concise and condensed way of uh, kind of uh, presenting that information. Uh, in terms of improvements, I might say, uh, and I'm not sure if this functionality currently exists, but uh, I had some trouble finding out how to track variables of interest that weren't necessarily constraints, design variables, or objectives. So like state variables might be something, uh, going back to the iteration kind of, uh, or this, the, the solver recorder feature uh, note, being able to make sure that your structural displacements aren't going wacky during uh, some of the uh, optimization um, convergence history might be of, uh, of use as well. So having that functionality um, could be of interest. Um, and then the history files can be a little bit large too. Um, the, uh, the SQL files, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure if there's, uh, depending on the, the size of the, the model and the, the size of the uh, optimization problem, um, it, it can take up a disproportionate amount of space. So I'm not sure if there's maybe potential uh, for further file optimization there, uh, file size optimization. Uh, so overall, I'd say um, one of the things I really like about the, the OpenMDL framework and the community as a whole is that uh, the development team has been really, really responsive to my uh, insistent prods, um, <laughs> usually getting back to me within like a week or so if, um, you know, my complaint ends up being a bug, um, the bug is usually fixed within, within a week or two. So it's um, really, 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 really responsive. So I really appreciate that with some of the work we're doing. We don't have time to to necessarily wait for uh, you know six month uh, or year year, year long uh, development cycle, so I uh, really appreciate that. And the the open source community as a whole too. Um, uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, open source developers that are adding to the OpenMDL for, uh, library um, and developing their own code suites that um, we in industry are able to take advantage of, um, and also potentially provide um, uh, some some feedback as well. Um, so for instance, on the open and arrow struct side, we were able to make some developments to the VLM solver and provide that back to the public, um, the public repo on that one for other people to use. So um, it's kind of a, a very healthy environment for uh, further uh, collaboration between, I would say, industry and uh, academia. Um, and then in terms of uh, improvements, I can't really say anything on that. Um, like I said, kudos to the development team. Um, they've been doing a really good job of kind of supporting this, um, supporting this work. Um, finally, where we kind of see OpenMDL falling in our uh, design paradigm at Aurora is uh, somewhere, somewhere between conceptual design and detailed design, where basically we have some low-level, uh, low-fidelity tools to look at some of the, the low-level metrics of, of our aircraft once the requirements have been defined, and once a rough idea of 
kind of uh, the broad parameters of the aircraft have been defined, but we'll use those as inputs to our medium fidelity um, open, uh, open MDAO tool uh, to do some uh, higher level optimization of, of the, uh, the, the vehicle. And then once that's done, uh, we see that it's kind of providing an initial guess or a starting point for the more detailed design phase that's, that will um, be done in a more traditional fashion by um, manual by uh, a set of engineers. Uh, we're also looking into the opportunity to kind of extend this, um, this boundary out further to the right and more into the detailed design uh, phase using uh, more higher fidelity analysis tools and um, operations. Uh, but overall, I think even just uh, implementing it kind of in this medium fidelity range offers a lot of um, benefits in terms of reducing uh, uh, redesign and recycle of, uh, of uh, kind of reiteration between different uh, disciplines that can be avoided through uh, the MDO uh, architecture. Um, so that's all for, that I have to say for my, my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for having me out here and uh, look forward to hearing some more on the development that's going on uh, with the OpenMDA framework. I would like to acknowledge um, uh, NASA for funding, um, being the, the, the funder for uh, a lot of this work that I presented here. Um, the University of Minnesota, which is the prime um, contractee for, uh, uh, contractor for this project um, uh, that we are subbing on. Um, and uh, with that, you know, any questions, uh, please, uh, please share them. Tim's being far too modest. Uh, well, we always try to fix bugs as quickly as possible. He very helpfully either provides us a test or localizes the problem to the specific part of the code that's broken. So uh, that helps tremendously in getting rapid response, I assure you. Not this guy. <laughs> Don't make me look for it. Yeah, that sounds like Tim. But anyway, um, question on uh, all this. Uh, because you've used Bovis and uh, Opti yeah. as well. Um, what are the differences and is there a potential for taking the best features of each? I think it's very similar. I, I assume a lot of it's maybe inspired by OptView, um, a lot of the functionality. Uh, so from my perspective, I see a lot of similarity between the two. Um, I'd say right now Ovis is only a half step beyond what OptView did because it also integrates the N2. Um, but uh, I, one of the development thrusts that we'd like to do for the next year, and I'll talk about this more in detail, is, is possibly look at improving that substantially, um, making it much more tightly coupled to the model structure and more interactive so you can inspect like large swaths of data and things like that. No, I guess what I'm uh, getting at, I think my students mostly are using still OpView. Not many people are using OVIS, that's right. And, yeah. You know, trying to merge the two, you know, this office, office app, for example, the searching through the... It does. We, of... we tried to pull as much of the functionality that you guys prototyped in op, in OpView. I would say the, the one thing that, um, that your code that you're talking about for the internet audience, uh, which is called... Um, OpView? Op, yeah. Yeah, OpView. Uh, that, that's tied just to PyOpSparse. So anything you hook up to PyOpSparse can use OpView, where Ovis is tied only to OpenMDAO. Yeah. So, but can we come up with a, uh, uh, a joint tool that is compatible with both? Maybe. Uh, does that make sense even? I don't Ma know. Maybe. It's possible, yeah. Could PyOpSparse will jump in here? So no. So OpView was developed in PyOpSparse in the beginning. As I started to use OpenMDAO more, I made it so that it was independent of, it could use OpenMDAO databases or PyOpSparse history files, and based on which one they're reading it, it should be Right. I worked directly with Drive while I was off base, rather than the developer, the initial developer of OVIS, to make sure that all the features that you might be using off you go into this OVIS, which is available in OpenMDO, but it needs to be used. So I guess the answer is clearly yes. There's yeah. some there's some shared development we a can lot. do, or maybe yeah. like a, a separate back end. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just not, rather not having, not having to maintain two tools. So. Yeah, OVIS was very much a prototyping effort to uh -huh. figure out sort of like also an architecture in which we wanted to develop our, our visualization tool. Um, OpView is written sort of as a standalone TK thing. Ovis is actually written on top of Electron, mm -hmm. which is like a much bigger sort of application development framework. So yeah. there was a lot of sort of figuring out what we were, how we were gonna do what we were gonna do. Yeah. But you're right, moving forward, we should probably join forces and try to develop one generalized tool. Mm -hmm. several times 
Speak, speak up a little. Sorry, I ran into that several times in developing dynamos. Um, there are two ways I handle that. One is I just I have to a priori decide these are the inputs everyone gets, and then those become options on all my parameters. The other way um, was when I was issuing connections, I was issuing connections inside a group where I didn't necessarily know what was going on in each component in that group because that component hadn't been set up yet. The, the setup stack works from outside yeah. to yeah. inside. Mm -hmm. um, there is another method called configure. Configure takes place after setup, um, and it works the other way around. It starts with the deepest set components and mm -hmm. works its way back out. Mm -hmm. um, that worked really well. You're allowed to issue connections in configure. It's a little bit different than the behavior of, of the setup functionality. Mm -hmm. But one of the things you're allowed to do there now is issue connections. Um, and I know it's, it's not always, it's going to be situation dependent, So, but you might want to look into seeing if you could figure out a way, like if it's, if it's connections issue, to maybe implement that in configure. Um, and then maybe at that point, all of your information will be known. Yeah, that might be something I have to look into. I mean, another difficulty that I found with that is like, I. All the codes that I'm developing now are parallelized. So another problem is that like uh, a lot of the times the the MPI uh, object hasn't been created for each of the components until that component has been set up anyway. So um, that's like another difficulty to kind of get around. I, I can look into the configure command, but I, I, I vaguely remember looking into it at some point, but I can't remember why I didn't follow up on that. Um, so, so this issue has shown up in your work. I know it's actually also affecting uh, OM, uh, OpenMDO's fluid structure interface, which uh, Anil will be talking about. So I, I think probably we need to maybe schedule a side workshop to look at some design patterns that can maybe get us around this and think about modifying OpenMDO to support the, the needed functionality better. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'll be presenting this at SciTech, actually. And I think, again, for the like, um, comparison, so I think some of those problems are arising because of our, like, initial way we approach the aerospace problems in our lab. We need to look at all our state size and then, like you said, parallel, which might change in those processes. So maybe we can have a like, pre set up phase where the components talk to each other in terms of, like, the state size, and then open this and allocate this correct, like, based on each process. So that's, yeah. So yeah. the suggestion there is that as a design pattern, you could maybe create some, some objects that are independent of OpenMDO that, are, you know, that deal with the com and the distribution that are then handed off to multiple different components. That's roughly the approach I took when I wrapped AD Flow in OpenMDAO. Right. Uh, so that's a design pattern we can look at, but there are, there are still some gotchas even in that kind of configuration. Right, and one, one thing I will say to, I mean, like that's something I thought about doing as well as actually writing the functions or, or the modules outside of OpenMDAO and having like a very weak layer wrapper. Mm -hmm. And the only problem with that is like, again, going back to the MPI object, you're basically gonna have to instantiate another MPI object outside of OpenMDAO, and you're, then you're not really getting the benefits of OpenMDAO's parallelization anymore. Yeah, kind so of, yeah. To, to avoid trying to solve this problem now, uh, yeah. I, think, I think it's pretty clear we need to establish maybe a, a side workshop to like work on this design issue. But yeah. yeah, definitely an area for, for future development. All right, I, yep, good job.